Good morning, gang. Pooja, I'm looking at your um, your name on, on Zoom here. Pooja T N T E Great. Do we do you want us to call you now uh, Pooja the Great? Is that what you are? Pooja, what do you got there? Okay, <laughs> maybe we'll get her later. Um, all right, well, <clears throat> good morning to everybody. Um, I had a little bit of um, trouble. This is, and most of you wouldn't have any clue uh, because you were here with me on Monday, um, but there were a couple that uh, missed class on Monday for different reasons. and. I didn't transfer the uh, the Zoom correctly over to the second semester, and I don't know if it recorded to the second semester. It recorded the first semester, so I think now that I'm straightened out, and uh, the recordings for second semester are uh, in the second semester class. As I told you on Monday morning, uh, we're going to lose the first semester, so I need to make sure that uh, we're back on. Um, it is kind of nice to be able to go and see a replay. If you didn't quite catch something, or you didn't. You didn't understand what I said there, and you need that. You can always go back and, and see the class again. That's that's kind of a, a cool feature. There's Pooja the Great. I was asking you, uh, what's what's with your name on on Zoom? I joined I joined on my phone because it was asking for a password, and I like got it wrong or something. Oh. <laughs> I see. So you're with us now. Yeah, because I was uh, talking to you and hello. Okay, so um, I had asked you to try some problems in a worksheet called Mole Conversions and Other Delights. I don't know if you found it very delightful, um, but I realized when I started looking over yours, I didn't grade it, but I wanted to see, you know, I just kind of take a temperature of, of how, how it went for you. Um, and it didn't take me long to realize nuts. I gave you that thing, but I didn't tell you what the seven diatomic elements are. Uh, and if you did that worksheet, then I think it was question number two. I have it. Uh, I was just looking at it. Question number two, list all of the diatomic elements. I never told you that. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Other than that, you should have been able to do all of those problems if you understood mole conversions. Um, but if if you're having trouble with mole conversions, that's why we do this practice. I wanted you to um, to to try some of the problems, um, take a stab at doing dimensional analysis using the unit moles, and we'll see how it was. And if you struggled with it. And I did, I, I got some, you know, I don't really understand this kind of messages, which that, that's why we do this. It's okay. I would like to uh, go over a few of them. I'm not going to go over every single one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of you um, got it and, and you did an awesome at it. Some of you didn't show any work. You just put all the answers down. Please do not do that. Even on homework. I don't really, um, homework is an opportunity for you to practice your skill and for me to see how, how things are going for you. And I can't really tell anything if you just give me the answer. I don't know if that means that you just copy the answer for some, from somebody, if you had somebody show you how to do it um, and you really still don't understand. Uh, but if you show your work, uh, at least that convinces me whether right or wrong. Um, but I have some sense of peace that you understand it. If I see your work that supports your answer. So please show me your work. Uh, you don't have to show me every step. If you can just at least show me what you're setting up to be able to get to the answer that you got, that's all I'm looking for. I don't want a 20 minute assignment to turn into an hour long assignment because you've got to write every single thing out. I don't want you to do that, but I would like you to show me, um, show me that kind of what you're thinking as you do the problem. If you will, um, take that assignment out, the mole conversion assignment. Um, 
I'm going to go to it. Oh, no, so it is asking for an, a password. I will change that. I think I can do away with the password. I must have missed it when I was checking boxes. There it is. And number one, all I was asking for was for you to add the atomic masses together. Now, in 1B, um, that was, I, I like to do that, uh, draw on things that you've already learned in this class. So, yeah, give the molar mass of the compound that's named aluminum sulfate. Well, you can't give its molar mass correctly unless you can write the formula for it. Um, and this is where uh, it's it very helpful to know the polyatomic ions, to know what the charges of ions are. This is typical chemistry kind of work. Um, we don't just learn something and then, okay, we, we've done that and, and move on. Chemistry is a, you know, is a, um, it's an endeavor. It's not just a, a collection of facts that uh, you can, you'll learn kind of factoids along the way. And then, okay, at the end of the course, okay, so I learned, a, a, or I did a chemistry class. Things built. And we do naming at the beginning of the year and how to write chemical formulas and, and uh, uh, well, formulas for compounds. The next thing that we do after moles is going to be chemical reactions. And when atoms and ions are rearranging in a reaction, we need to know what formulas of, of compounds and ions things have. Because uh, when, when there's a rearrangement, let's say uh, you've got a, nit a nitrate compound that reacts. The nitrate part may stay together. Nitrate is NO3, is a polyatomic ion. So you need to know that what nitrate is uh, as it uh, rearranges. So, um, yeah, we, we do need to not forget that stuff. So I would suggest that you keep your polyatomic ion list toward the top of your stack of chemistry things. You need a periodic table all the time. And I would say probably just keep your polyatomic ion list right with your periodic table because that's kind of an extension of the periodic table. I told you at the time, we use polyatomic ions all the time. So aluminum sulfate is made up of, oops, aluminum ions, which are a positive three ion, and sulfate ions, which is SO4 with a negative two. That's my polyatomic here. So the formula of aluminum sulfate, remember we do that crisscross method where we take the three and the two and we just switch places. Al2, SO4, taken three times. That's the formula for aluminum sulfate. So to find the molar mass of it, you would have to add two Al's. Now the three distributes to the S's and the O's. So there are three S's and 12 oxygens. So we're looking at uh, two times 27.0 for the aluminum. The sulfur is three times 32.1. And then the oxygen is 12 times 16.0. So that, that's why I did that. I wanted you to, to realize, oh, he's not just playing, um, you know, uh, Tonka trucks here. We, we have to know how to, how to put our understanding together. So whatever that adds up to be. Now for number two. I apologize. I'm so sorry about that. Um, I had the next slide that we would do uh, in our notes would have been the seven diatomic elements. Um, and I'll just tell you what they are now. Even though this is this is kind of a review of a worksheet time, this part is new. There are seven elements that when they're by themselves as elements, they exist as two atoms bonded together making a molecule. You already know very well that oxygen exists as O2. Uh, it exists as O2. It has to do with the bonding. Oxygen is not following the octet rule. And those atoms are so small, um, 
it, it really does help oxygen to to get an octet. So um, so it's more stable if there's two oxygens that are bonded to each other with a double bond so that both oxygens have eight electrons around. <laughs> yeah, no problem, so on. Okay, so oxygen is one of the diatomic. In fact, I'm going to put oxygen in uh, kind of in the order. It's not first. Oxygen exists as O2 when it's by itself. So pure oxygen would be O2. That's not true of all elements. There's only seven elements that exist as diatomic. So the word diatomic means two atoms. They exist, those elements exist as two atoms. The other ones are hydrogen. And you probably have heard that before. The hydrogen exists as H2. It's not just H when it's a free gas, it's H2. And nitrogen is also. So the primary ingredients of the air around us are nitrogen and oxygen. So nitrogen exists as N2 and oxygen exists as O2. That's not why they're in the air. They're in the air for, for you know, a geologic reason. But yeah, it just happens that those two elements that are in the air uh, are diatomic. The other four elements, so there's, there's seven. It doesn't say that there are seven here in question number two, but there's seven of them. Uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. And then the other four are the halogen family. Fluorine is F2, chlorine is Cl2, bromine and iodine. Now there's another element in the halogen family at the bottom underneath iodine is astatine, AT. Um, I don't know if astatine is diatomic or not, but we'll never use astatine. Astatine is highly radioactive. It's got a half-life of seconds. I, I mean, it, it's, it's here and then it's gone because it rate, um, decays so fast. So um, I don't pay attention to astatine. As far as I'm concerned, astatine is not even an element because we don't do anything with it unless you're studying radioactivity of highly radioactive elements. So these are the seven diatomic elements. The way I was taught to remember them, and it is good to know these. I mean, when we're online, it's not like you have to memorize anything because you could just cheat. Uh, that's, that's, that's how the year is, I, I, I get it. But um, yeah, if we were in class and, and we were taking tests with it, I would expect you to know the seven diatomic elements, put them in your brain. The way I learned the seven diatomic elements are that they are hydrogen and that the other six elements make the shape of a seven on the periodic table. It goes N-O-F-C-L-B-R-I. Isn't that nice? They make the shape of a seven. So you can remember there are seven other. You just have to remember there's hydrogen and then the other six are the shape of a seven. <laughs> So why do we need to know that? Why am I teaching you that now and not some other time in the course? Well, I teach you that now because when we're talking about moles, if I say, well, what is the mass of one mole of oxygen, oxygen gas? We need to remember that oxygen gas is O2. So the molar mass of O2 is actually not 16 from the periodic table. It's 32. It's 16 times 2 because every molecule of oxygen has two oxygen atoms in it. One mole of chlorine is one mole of Cl2. The molar mass would be 71, not 35.5. I'm getting those numbers from the periodic table. Chlorine's atomic mass is 35.5, but one mole of chlorine would be one mole of Cl2. So these elements, these seven elements, are only diatomic when they're by themselves as a free element. As soon as they go into a compound, then they're not diatomic anymore. There are however many atoms of that element are in the compound. For instance, water. Water is H2O. So in H2O, you've got two H's and one oxygen. You don't just make oxygen always two no matter what. Just when they're by themselves, they're considered diatomic elements. Anybody have any questions about that? So I saw a lot of you answer that question. I'm trusting that you went to the internet and just typed in diatomic elements, and it gave you uh, the seven. It may have given you other ones too, but these are the, the seven um, very well-known common elements that are diatomic. 
questions on that? Okay, I thought that I told you I'm not going to go through this whole thing and I'm not going to spend this much time on every one of these questions. But I think what I'd, do, what I'd like to do is just go through every other one. I'll do every other even one since I now finished with number two here. I'm going to uh, clear that off and jump up to number four. Let's see if I can get a few of these on the screen at one time. Yeah, so um, I don't have to keep deleting this. But for number four, uh, and I would encourage you, if you can, print that flow chart so that you can always just have that accessible and, and uh, be able to look at that. Um, I give that flow chart when everybody is in school. I don't have you memorize the flow chart. I do want people to memorize the seven diatomic elements. Um, but the flow charts of how to do mole conversions, I'm totally fine if you refer to the flow chart. So we're going uh, from 1.5 times 10 to the 22nd atoms of magnesium. Magnesium is not diatomic, it's just Mg. And we're finding how many moles that would be. So we're going from particles to moles. Uh, and the relationship between particles and moles is there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles or atoms of magnesium in one mole of magnesium. That's how we do that one. Now on our calculator, as I keep encouraging you to do, use the EE button for scientific notation, 1.5 EE22 divided by 6.02 EE23. That's not even that many keystrokes. It's so easy to do it that way. Stop with the parentheses times 10 to the power, all that. Just use the EE button, get used to it. You're going to like having it. So the answer to that one, oops, um, let's see. I have the answer key pulled up on a different document. 0 0.025 moles, 0 0.025. I have a question sure. for this one. When we're using uh, scientific notation, what would we um, use for our significant sig figs? Figures? Yeah, don't count the 10 to the power for sig figs. You just count the number that's out in front. So I have okay. two sig figs for the first quantity. And then 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, that has three sig figs. That has been uh, determined uh, by scientists. I think they've actually come out with Avogadro's number to like 10 sig figs. <laughs> so they're pretty sure of that number. Um, but yeah, when I give it to you, it's only three. So you do count that for sig figs, but your answer can only have two because the first number had two. Okay, yeah, thanks for asking that. Anything else about this one? Okay, so for number six, we're talking about a gas and the relationship between moles and volume. So we're starting with 12 liters and we need to convert that into moles. Well, there's a relationship between liters and moles and that is, there's 22.4 liters in every one mole of any gas, and this gas is SO2. So 12 divided by 22.4 is all we have to do. The liters cancel out, we have the unit we want. These are, uh, first ones are just one step. As you see, I started with several one-step conversions, and then we went to two-step conversions. And the most steps you'll have when converting units is two. So um, you know there was just a lot of practice and repetition for this thing. Not every question looked the same because we can have different starting and ending points. But it was just a lot of, you know, uh, the same kind of thing. So the answer to number six was 0.536. Uh, and we can have three sig figs on that one because the 12.0 had three sig figs and the 22.4, 0 0.536 moles. That's so two. If you did this completely wrong, um, you don't need to necessarily turn your homework back in. I'm going to see that you did the homework. I'm going to look at the odd numbered problems uh, and see kind of how they went. Um, and I, you're going to get full credit for trying this thing. Okay. I do need you to know how to do these though. There'll be more practice certainly. And of course we'll have a, a test coming up. Um, I'll update the calendar very soon, too, because the test is not that far away. The mole chapter is pretty short. Um, anyway, let's let's move on here. We'll talk about that soon. Number eight, if you had the patience to count 6.5 times 10 to the 21st molecule, I mean, the patience to count, that's, again, ridiculous. It would count, it would take 
at least in, on the order of millions of years to count to that number. Um, again, if you could count millions of numbers every second, it would take you millions of years to get to that number. Uh, so anyway, we're not counting. But we're going from a number of molecules of this compound to the mass of the compound. There's going to be two steps in that one. Always go from your first unit to moles, if it's not already in moles, and then go to the second unit. So because every unit has moles in common. Two steps, 6.5 times 10 to the 21st. We're always going to start with the quantity we're given, molecules. Uh, that's particles. And then uh, we'll get to moles by doing one mole over Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. This is one mole of lithium carbonate. And then uh, we don't have the unit that we want. We want mass. We only have moles right now. So the mass of that thing would be found by having one mole on the bottom. So the moles cancel out. And then the molar mass of lithium carbonate on top. The molar mass of lithium carbonate, um, I can cheat and look at my answer key here, 73.8 grams. So the answer is 0 0.80. We started with two sig figs. Uh, our conversions have three sig figs, so we're going to be stuck with two sig figs. 0 0.80 grams. We good? I'm going to erase this unless you yell out that you need a second to copy something down. Three, two, one. Okay, so I'm going to move to number 10. Yeah, and then there's just 11 questions in the first place. So number 10 and number 11, there was multiple steps to be able to answer the question. For number 10, you were stuck either converting both of those to volume, or if you just convert both of those gases to moles, the one with the more moles is going to be the more volume because all gases will have the same volume. <laughs> so the one with the more moles would have the most volume. But just uh, because it's fun, we'll calculate what volume both of these things have. So the oxygen, it didn't matter that oxygen was diatomic because we're just going from moles to volume. Uh, so 7.5 moles of oxygen, that was O2, going to volume, that would be one mole on the bottom, 22.4 liters. Oops, liters of oxygen. That's an L of O2. I messed that up. Um, so 7.5 times 22.4 gives us. Ah, I didn't write that down. Seven point five times twenty two point four, one hundred sixty eight. Now I only had two sig figs there, so I'm going to round the one sixty eight to one hundred seventy liters of oxygen. Uh, and then for the fluorine, I'm going to have to do two steps here because I have one hundred twenty grams of F two. Now, this is where it's important that fluorine is diatomic, because when I go to moles of F2, I got to double the atomic mass. So fluorine on the periodic table has a mass of 19.0. F2 then is twice that, 38.0 grams. See what I did there? Then you're going from moles to liters. One mole on the bottom. 22.4 liters on top. So this is a two-step deal. Um, 120 divided by 38 times 22.4. So we have a volume of 70, 71. Only two sig figs allowed because the number out there, 120 only had two. 71 liters of F2. So which one has more volume? The winner is oxygen. For number 11, there's no shortcut to this one. You've got to convert each of those four quantities into grams. Um, now, B was already in grams, so you didn't have to do any conversion there. But A, you'd have to go from liters of that gas into grams of chlorine. 
C, you have to go from particles of that substance into uh, mass. And then for D, you had to go from moles of KCl into mass. So you have to convert all four, all three of those four into grams. One is already in grams. And then choose the one that's got the highest. I can't remember. Wait. I believe the answer was B, the one that was already in grams, but. Mm. Oh, okay. Sure. What was the answer? Anybody confident in their answer? I'm not confident, but I got C. Okay. <laughs> I was just going on my memory because I don't remember it uh, really. So Ella is not confident, but got C. Did anybody agree with I got Ella? C too. I got C. Okay, got all right, C. good, good, good. So the more people that say they got C, maybe the more your confidence will be up. Yes, I'm more confident now. <laughs> good. Um, some of you actually colored the mole. Uh, you gave me a big smile. Some of you added a little bit of effect, digital effect to the mole. Thank you for doing that. It just, it just brings a smile to me. Swetha, I always count on you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody have any questions about that worksheet? Thank you for doing it. Thanks for trying to just uh, tackle it. Uh, I know that one would have taken you a few minutes to do. Uh, I appreciate that staying up with the class and, and uh, keeping things going. And hopefully, uh, if you made any mistakes or had any confusion or apprehension about it, you're feeling a little bit better now. Uh, and if you already knew what you were doing, I'm hoping that, uh, that that wasn't a total waste of time because I was able to affirm uh, that you did know what you were doing. We have a new concept today. Uh, it's a short and I think a pretty simple concept. Um, I'm going to show it to you. And then I have a lab that Mr. Hubble and I have recorded. The next two sessions, well, today and the next time we meet, uh, are both going to be um, concepts where we'll have a lab that goes with it. So uh, I'm going to just show you that. Well, we're going to open up our um, notes. I, I do need to show you this concept. Here's our PowerPoint. And Let's see, this is the beginning of the chapter. I need to get kind of far down. We've covered a lot so far. Okay, yeah, look at this. We did this slide together the last time we were together. Oh, yeah, um, I did this example with you. And then the very next thing, diatomic elements. Ah, I should have done this one too to show you that before I gave you that worksheet. There they are. Uh, and by the way, if you're in college, um, then there's a different memory trick that's used to remember the seven diatomic elements. Uh, I'll just tell you that because it'll give you a smile anyway. I'm not promoting drinking alcohol. In fact, I'm against uh, people drinking alcohol. I think it does bad things to people and they become bad people when people drink alcohol. But this is kind of a funny um, way to remember it. Uh, you can remember the saying, have no fear of ice cold beer. <laughs> uh, and those seven words, have no fear of ice cold beer. Uh, if you can remember that, those are the seven elements, hydrogen, nitrogen, fear, oxygen of, sorry, fluorine, oxygen, ice is iodine, cold is chlorine, beer is bromine. So, um, if uh, <laughs> if the shape of the seven on the periodic table doesn't help you to remember, maybe the ice cold beer will help you remember. So yeah, seven diatomic elements do keep those uh, in your kind of in your brain. Maybe you'd even want to write those seven on your periodic table. That would be a good uh, thing to help you to remember. Okay, so uh, the the next concept that we have, and this would be the only concept that we learned today, is uh, a quantity percent composition. When you have a mixture or even a compound, you've got more than one element that makes up that, that um, collection. Sometimes it's interesting to know what percent of one of the elements makes up the compound. Here's an example that I can give you. 
uh, I, I don't remember this well because this is a number of years ago. My family and I were traveling through the Upper Peninsula toward Wisconsin, uh, and uh, we passed through the town of Iron Mountain. Iron Mountain, right outside of the town, has an iron mine, like a, an iron mine where you go down under the ground and, and uh, they, they mine iron. They don't, it's not an active iron mine anymore, but they give tours. And so um, we went by there, and I said to my wife, I would love to go on the iron mine tour. And so on the way back home, uh, we stopped in Iron Mountain, uh, and it was it was cool. They have uh, people that that were familiar with the mining industry and um, and how you know the the Iron Mountain. This is way up in the UP, Western Upper Peninsula, but it's it's really cool up there. So anyway, uh, they they took us on a tour, and when you go down underground and you find iron, the iron is not nice and shiny metallic iron it's it's rust that has uh, kind of been not kind of it, it has been um oxidized into a rock and it doesn't look like iron at all the guide told us when we were down there that uh, they had a standard for how much what percent of iron was worthy of, of digging out of the ground and taking up to the surface to use for refining. I can't remember now what the threshold was. It was like 38%. I, I'm pretty sure that the number was in the 30s. The rock had to have at least a content of 30 some percent iron. Otherwise it wasn't worth the expense um, to, to get it out of the ground and up to the surface and, and run it through the chemical treatment to get the clean iron out of it that they would use to make steel with. And of course they would make trains and cars and you know equipment tools with that iron, but it starts under the ground. So you know a lot of math is done to determine how much uh, iron needs to be in that rock in order to make it worthwhile uh, to, to take out of the ground. So they've taken all the iron rich rock out of Iron Mountain and now they don't use it anymore because it's not valuable to them anymore. There's too low of a, uh, of a concentration of iron in that rock. They've gone to other places. I don't know where they get. There are still active iron docks like in Marquette, which is in the, um, along Lake Superior. Uh, we, we were traveling through there too. And uh, we went to an iron dock where ships take iron and, and just, it's just this ugly red rock that, and, and a ship full of this stuff that it dumps on to a um, like a, a, a bridge where they convey it off and uh, truck it out to, to iron refining kind of factories. Pretty cool. I mean, it's not it's not like watching a, a Bollywood movie or whatever, but it, it's it's cool. It's interesting. You know, it's like one of those things. It's how our world works. Um, so that thirty whatever I think it was like thirty eight percent. That thirty eight percent of of the rock needed to be determined. Um, so that's one example of where we would use percent composition. Some medicines uh, measure what percent of a concentration in a medicine, um, you know, in, in terms of a dose, uh, how much you're, you're supposed to be taking is, is kind of a, a percent. Sometimes they use other units to uh, determine doses and concentrations, but sometimes percent is used. In general, we've all learned about percents. Your grades are based on percents. So, you know, your, your kind of livelihood as a student is centered around percents. So you all, I think, have a sense of uh, what, what percents are. If I gave a test and there were 20 questions on it and you got 18 out of 20, you could find what percent you got by taking the part that you got right, 18, divided by the whole amount which was 20 and then times 100. 18 divided by 20 times 100 tells you what percent you got. 18 divided by 20 would be 0.9 and then times 100 makes 90%. That means that your part was 90% of the whole amount. So when you take a percent, you're, um, you're essentially, any percent you take, you're taking the part that you're interested in dividing by the whole amount.
in terms of chemistry, the percent composition, comp the word composition means what something is made of, what it's composed of. Each element in the compound contributes a certain percent to the mass. So when you have a compound, all the elements percent will add up to 100%. Obviously, that's what the, sorry, the compound is made of. So in terms of percent composition in chemistry, the percent would be the part, the mass of each element, divided by the whole, which is the mass of the whole compound. The numerator is always smaller than the denominator. So you get some, some decimal number, and then you multiply it by 100 um, to just uh, get things in terms of 100. What part of 100 is each of the elements that are in the compound? There's two different ways to find the percent composition, depending on what information you're given in the problem. Sometimes you're given mass information, like you'll have the mass of a compound, and then it'll tell you what mass of one or more of the elements there are there. So you'll be asked to find the percent. Um, for instance, in this one, you have 13.56 grams of an iron oxide compound. So they're telling you what the whole mass of the compound is. There are 9.62 grams of iron present. So what is the percent composition? When you see a problem that asks for the percent composition, you have to give the percent of all elements. Sometimes the problem will just ask you, what is the percent of this element? So you just have to do one step. In the, when it says percent composition, You've got to do this calculation multiple times for that question. So uh, for this, there's there's two elements in it. And it, it doesn't say explicitly that there's two elements in it, but it says it's an iron oxide compound. An iron oxide compound means there's iron and there's oxygen. So look at the problem if you need a clue as to how many elements or what elements are in there. Uh, it'll have to tell you something about the compound. So very simply, we're going to need a percent of iron and a percent of oxygen. And this is, I'm, I'm not trying to make it sound like this is a hard thing that we have to figure out. It's very easy. Uh, the percent of iron would be, and you don't need to do this part, but I'll just try to make this very clear at the beginning. It's the mass of the iron divided by the mass of the compound times 100. Uh, and then oxygen is the same thing. It's not worth me writing it all out. Uh, the mass of the iron would be uh, 9.62, just give that to us, over 13.56 grams, that's the whole compound, times 100. Notice the unit grams cancels out and we're just left with, we're left with no unit, but the 100 really is 100%, so you, put, you kind of slap the percent sign on it at the end. And then for the oxygen, we need the mass of oxygen. What is the mass of oxygen here? Well, they gave us two numbers in the problem. They gave us the mass of the compound and the mass of one of the elements. So there's two different ways to do the mass of oxygen. The easiest thing to do would be to find this answer and then just take 100 minus, whoops, I just put 10, 100 minus that answer uh, and, and you've got it. That's it. That's the easiest thing to do. Let's see, 9.62. divided by 13.56, that's going to give us 70.9%. Looks like we're going to have three sig figs on our answer. I got three sig figs on top, four sig figs on the bottom, uh, so I can have three in my answer. Now for the oxygen, just take 100. You know that the elements have to add up to 100%. So the simplest thing to do would be just to take 100 minus 70.9. Or you could take the mass of oxygen which you'd have to subtract 13.56 minus 9.62. I don't see why anybody would want to do that though. It's just more work. 100 minus 70.9 is close to 30, but it's just under 30, it's 29.1. Yeah. Percent composition, the mass of the compound, uh, sorry, <laughs> no. the mass of the element divided by the mass of the compound.
The next problem will involve different information being given to us. Yep. Okay, so we know that. There it is. Now, another example would be something like this. Find the percent composition of, and then they just give you a compound with no numbers in it, except for the subscripts in the formula. How am I going to find the mass of the compound and the mass of the element when it doesn't even give me any data? In this case, it's asking us for the percent composition of this compound, which has three elements in it. That means that somehow we're going to have to find the mass of so, well, the percent of sodium, the percent of carbon, and the percent of oxygen. We're going to have to give three answers in this one. Where do we get our numbers from? <laughs> what do we do here? What you want to do is we call this a theoretical percent. Um, when you see the word theoretical, and I, geez. Um, when you see the term theoretical, and I use the word theoretical quite a bit. Theoretical means uh, in theory, this is what the percent would be. It, it means you're not using experimental data, you're using accepted values. Okay, so we're looking to use accepted values to find uh, the percent composition, assuming everything is perfect here. That's what theoretical means. It, it just means assume everything is perfect. Assume things are going the way we expect them to. So um, in the previous problem, if I can go back there for a second, I'm going to stick up my writing on here. This is not theoretical. This is actual experimental data. Theoretical means that um, that you're just going to use table values. So what table are we talking about here? Well, use the periodic table. So what we want to do is assume you have one mole of the compound. As soon as you make an assumption you got one mole of sodium carbonate, that means you know what the mass is. It would be the theoretical mass, the mass of one mole of sodium carbonate. That would be its molar mass. So the denominator for all of these would be the molar mass. Uh, that means that uh, you're going to use all periodic table values Write that down for yourself. We're going to assume one mole of the compound, and then we can use all the values in the periodic table. The denominator for all three of these calculations will be the same because it's the mass of the compound every time. It is the molar mass. So the percent of sodium would be, I'm going to write just for this one, uh, the mass of sodium, what the definition of percent sodium would be. Okay, and that would be uh, the mass of sodium. There are two sodium atoms here, so it would be two times 23.0 grams on top divided by the molar mass, the mass of a whole mole of the compound. So that would be, I'm going to write it out in full for this one too, so you see where my numbers came from. Two times 23 plus carbon, which is 12.0 plus three oxygens, so it's three times 16.0. Remember, I go one place past the decimal for all of my atomic masses, and then times 100. Now, that bottom number, um, it's 106. It's 106. So my denominator is going to be 106 every time. The carbon, there's just one carbon. So it'll be 12.0 grams over 106 grams times 100. And then the oxygen is three times 16 grams over 106. Easy way to check this thing, get a percent for all of these and then add up this, make sure they add up to 100. So just cranking these numbers out. Uh, the percent of sodium is almost half of it, it's 43.4.
and then carbon is going to make up the smallest percent because it contributes the smallest mass, uh, 11.3. That was sodium. And then oxygen, you could uh, subtract 100 minus 43.4 minus 11.3 if you want to. I just had the number set up already. I'll just divide 45.3. Doing a quick check, it looks like my numbers add up to 100%. So I'm feeling pretty good that I did it right. Anybody have any questions about that? All right. So, um, yeah, my my added thing on there was assume you have one mole of the compound, and then the, that means that the mass of the compound is the molar mass. And there's all of our answers. If I clear out all my writing, we see we got the same thing. Okay, now here's another example that is a percent composition question with a twist. So now in this problem, I'm giving you the percent of nitrogen in a compound. I don't know what the compound is. Which compound of those three given is it? I think in this problem, we're stuck Finding the percent of N in all three of them. I, I would tell you, I know that it's not C because nitrogen is 14 times two. Oxygen is 16. In C, I know for sure nitrogen is going to make up more than 50% of that compound. It cannot be C because the nitrogen is going to contribute 28 grams. The oxygen only contributes 16 grams. Um, yeah, you've got over 50% nitrogen at C. I know it's not that one. So it's either A or B. So I've limited your work. <laughs> Find the percent of nitrogen in A, percent of nitrogen in B, and one of them is going to be 46.7. And I think now that we've eliminated C, all you really have to do is find the percent of nitrogen in A and if it's not 46.7, then you know it's B <laughs> because we've already eliminated C. Which one is it? Is it A or B? Um, what was the reason that we eliminated C? The reason we know it's not C? Nitrogen's mass is 14 and oxygen's mass is 16. So um, the percent of, so that means that nitrogen makes up 28 grams and oxygen makes up 16 grams. Nitrogen is going to be more than 50% in C. Is that not obvious? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, okay. So which one is it? Anybody have it? Can you show me with your hand? Make the shape of the letter for the answer with your hand. Ayush, that's what I'm talking about. All right, Amelia, you got it. Thank you. Come on, I'm looking for others. Katie, yep. Yep. Rhett, you got it. Suan, yes, thank you. Um, Gabe, I'm not so sure. Benati, come on, let me see that thing. Benati, no. <laughs> Gabe, no. All right, Benati, that's that's what that's right. That's better. Some of you don't want to be seen this morning, darn you. <laughs> Yusuf, what is that? I can't tell what. Oh yeah, okay, okay, I'll take. Is that an A, Yusuf? Oh, uh, is that a B? No, I don't like the B. It's A. A is the answer. <laughs> uh, Avril. What is what's the letter you're holding up? B? No, it's not B. It's A. In A, isn't it A? Um, nitrogen would be 14 over 30. That looks kind of like 46.7 to me. Where in NO2, 
what's the molar mass of NO2? 14 plus, in NO2, it's 14 over 46. 14 over 30 is 46.7%. 14 over 46 is 30.4%. I forgot to calculate the total mass for the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Oh, you just did 14 over 16. <laughs> uh, I, I accidentally divided by 100 instead of multiplying. Ah, okay. 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 So it's good. I mean, make mistakes and, and it's fine. You know, I might, I might give you a hard time, but you know, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Um, so A is the answer to this one. So you can see, I've given you three examples. All three examples look different. You're given different amount of information, but all of them kind of center around finding the percent of an element. Now, how are we doing for time? It's 8.13 and we're done at 8.50. Let's take a break. After we get back from a break, uh, I'm going to show you a lab and we'll just spend the rest of our time on the lab. Okay? So uh, let's come back at 8.20.
Well, it's been a long time since we've uh, done a lab in here. In fact, I didn't realize it until the last day of the semester, but we didn't have a lab the entire second quarter. Jeez. So yeah, we had a blank category. Um, <laughs> that is going to change big time. You're going to have a number of uh, lab activities this semester, including today and the next time we meet. And uh, the, over the next couple of chapters, there's quite a bit of um, lab work that, that's going to go into that category of labs and activities. In Schoology, uh, in the Moles chapter folder, the last assignment in there is the, um, the, the paper that I want you to complete for this lab. Um, I'm going to show you, it's, it's not, this is on YouTube. So in the class resources, there's a link to the channel. If you needed to go back and see anything, if you missed a measurement or whatever, um, then, then the video is there. We'll watch it right now. I'm going to give you the rest of our time together um, to work on it. And I just suggest that you try to work on it and stay on the session, at least for a little while, and make sure that you don't have any questions about it. Um, I guess I would just offer you, if you want to leave, it's fine. Watch the video with me. So uh, if, if we'll just talk about that, I guess, later on. Uh, let's take a look at this. The video is just over 12 minutes, less than 13 minutes. Um, no, no, no. There it is. Um, what this is not the actual video that I wanted to use. The percent composition lab. Uh, I do need you to know that. Yeah, it's twelve fifty three, so it's almost thirteen minutes. Um, we cut part of this thing out. This is an experiment where we're going to take potassium chlorate, which has a formula KClO3, KClO3. We're going to heat it up. When you heat up potassium chlorate, it breaks up into um, the oxygen leaves. I mean, the, the O2 escapes, it leaves. And what we're left with is just potassium chloride, KCl in the container. Uh, it's a really cool reaction because the KClO3, when it gets hot, it actually melts down to a liquid. You have this liquid ionic compound uh, and then it starts to bubble and bubble and bubble. And uh, after it is done releasing the oxygen, it, it's not bubbling because it's boiling. It lo almost looks like water that's boiling, but it's not. It's this compound, it's pure compound that's releasing oxygen from it as it decomposes. So you're going to see that the mass of the um, potassium chlorate is going to go down because it's losing oxygen. So we're going to take the mass of the compound at the beginning, and then we're going to take the mass of the compound at the end. Now you have to be very careful with your calculations, knowing what is contained in each measurement. You have to know what is contained in each measurement. That's going to be very important. So um, if you have access to, you know, of course you have access to it, but if you can print that worksheet for the lab, uh, print it out. Otherwise, just write your, your uh, observations or measurements on a, a blank sheet of paper and you can just fill that out, you know, from a blank sheet of paper. Just do all the calculations and answer the questions on that. Mr. Moore. Yes. Um, could you put it as a PDF? Oh, yes. Yes, I can. Give me just a second. Uh, so you can have that before we start. Uh, okay, percent oxygen in KCL of three. getting there. Okay, almost. Okay. Oh, 
thought I was just cranking this out. Okay, I see what I did. Uh, all right, I'm almost done. Well, I'm not going to keep saying that. <laughs> it's a relative uh, expression. There it is. Okay. So, yeah, refresh your Schoology page. It'll be there now. And go ahead and print it out the beginning of it, of course, it's just Mr. Hevel and I jibber jabbering. Here we go. Okay, so can you see Mr. Hevel? I, okay, I'm going to make that bigger. And here we go. And here is our mole expert, Mr. Hevel. That's right. Yes, indeed. I'm using our mole knowledge and everything at our disposal here to do a vast percent composition lab. Okay, so um, let's see, what we're using is potassium chlorate. Okay, we're going to heat this up and it's going to decompose. All right, and we can use that decomposition and the change in mass that occurs uh, to then help us calculate a mass percent composition. That's the basic idea here. Yeah, there's three elements in potassium chlorate. That's right. And I think we only want one of the three. If we can find the percent of oxygen, uh, right. then... That would be fine. Yep. Yep. So that's actually what happens when we heat this up. Uh, potassium chlorate, KClO3, is going to decompose into two things. Potassium chloride, KCl, and oxygen gas, O2. And so there'll be a mass change before and after heating. That difference is the oxygen that's been driven off. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can use that information then to get percent of oxygen by mass in potassium chloride. So um, one thing we're going to have to know is the mass of the compound that we're starting with. The balance is being stubborn. It's jumping all over the place. Oh, it is. Yeah, this one goes out to the thousands place, so it's pretty sensitive. Can't breathe on it. It seems like it's pretty stable. Mm -hmm. huh? Ooh, a little too much. We're trying to use somewhere between one and a half and two grams or yeah. something close to two grams. Yeah, the instruction sheet says use between 1.5 and 2 grams. So we're not just making that up. That's got to be that ought to work. Yep. So here's your first piece of data. Okay, so there's our starting mass yeah. of potassium chlorate. We'll stop moving here for a moment while that finds its mass. Good. We'll also want to have the mass of the dish, yep. the evaporating dish. And so we're going to heat potassium chlorate because it's going to get up to a pretty high temperature in a porcelain cup or dish you could call it. It's called an evaporating dish. We need to know the mass of this. Oops. Zero it out. Yeah, because the product will be in the dish at the end and we don't want to try to scrape mm -hmm. it out. <laughs> Just when I think, okay, we're done. Mm -hmm. Eighty-four point two four eight. We're gonna stay with that. I, I think that's pretty close. Okay. All right. So that's the mass of the empty evaporating dish. Yep. So what we'll do then. <clears throat> So we'll add our 
potassium chlorate to that. So we're going to fill this into dish. And essentially now we're going to heat it. Um, and to do that, we're going to use uh, a Bunsen burner and uh, a ring stand and a clay triangle that will hold the evaporating dish. So let's get the burner started. So using a Bunsen burner lighter makes a nice spark. Okay, and I don't know how well the flame shows up. Yeah, we can yeah, see the flame. Can you see it? Yep. So if you, so we haven't had a chance to use a Bunsen burner, if you lower the barrel all the way down, you cut off the oxygen supply, and you get the coolest possible flame. It's just mm -hmm. yellow. There's a lot of gas that's really not even burning because there's not enough oxygen coming in. And then as you raise the barrel, you let some oxygen in the bottom here, you get a hotter flame. It's blue now. We're going to keep going. So we want to get the hottest possible flame. And the tip of that inner blue cone is the hottest part of the Bunsen burner. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to try to set that under the dish. This is a cool reaction, too, because all ionic compounds are solid at room temperature. And this is a case where the solid is going to melt down. Um, a lot of ionic compounds will just decompose. Now, this one does decompose, but uh, it will melt first. You get mm -hmm. molten potassium chlorate. You have to be careful we don't melt your iPad. Yeah, yeah, we don't <laughs> want molten iPad. <laughs> could throw off our result. <laughs> Yep, it's starting. Kind of yes. see there at the edges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There it goes. So it's going to melt. And it really almost looks like water. Um, but then it's going to start bubbling quite a bit. And all that bubbling is the oxygen that's being driven out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of gives the look like it's boiling. But it's not boiling. You're right. It's, it's the oxygen that's given off. Looks like a little penguin's diving into the water off the ice, doesn't it? <laughs> the Bunsen burner's a little anemic. It sounds like it's working hard. It is. <laughs> yeah, see that bubbling in there? The bubbling showing up? Yeah, we can see yeah. the bubbling. Yeah. Some off on the edge here. Yeah, it gets nice and hot down there, as you see. Mm -hmm. Red hot. So yeah, the bubbling is the oxygen going away. And this is really cool because once all the oxygen is gone, then we have just potassium chloride in there and it goes back to solid. That's how we know that it's done. All right. Potassium chloride apparently has a higher melting temperature, so mm -hmm. it just solidifies. This is going to go on for a long time. There's a lot of oxygen that comes out of this, and um, we wound up getting impatient with it because it shouldn't take this long. I don't think Mr. Hevel uh, had the uh, once and burn. I'm just saying this is like watching right. the grass grow. Oh, this, this is, is the chemistry. This is real chemistry. That's right. You don't want to miss this.
<laughs> so eventually we turned the camera off uh, and got a bigger burner for it. Uh, that's coming up. If we were nice, we would just stop the camera. Right, but we wouldn't want that, to That didn't occur to us, though. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, Mr. Moore. Yes. Oh. oh, sorry. What was the mass of the dish with the potassium chlorate in it? Yeah, you'll have to add those two together. When I had you do the lab, we don't have those plastic weighing trays out. We just had you put it directly into the dish. Uh, so just add together the two masses that you have. That's oh, the, okay. The, yeah. Plus the, the chemical in it. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know why I didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, no problem. <laughs> So yeah, at this point, Mr. Hevel is lighting a figure. You can see this is a big boy uh, burner. Look at that thing. <laughs> it's like the, an upside down rocket ship. Um, so you're going to see a difference in the uh, bubbling. Soften our triangle too much. <laughs> right. We let that baby go like 15 minutes and it was just not getting anywhere. So um, yeah, we, we put the big boy burner on it and even still, it took another couple of minutes. There we go. That speeded things up. Now you can see it bubbling really good. It's pretty amazing how much oxygen comes out of it. that oxygen goes it's, it's going to solidify pretty fast and the longer that burner is under there the hotter it gets and the faster it'll bubble Quite a bit of oxygen in there when you There's look at the line. compound yeah yeah for sure uh, it's always kind of amazing how much oxygen is in there mm -hmm. which is one reason why i believe the most abundant element in the earth's crust is oxygen it's oxygen yeah oh, there goes you can on the bottom so. You can see there goes the oxygen, the last of it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> okay. Ah, very nice. There we go. So it should just be potassium chloride KCl left after the heating. Yep. Now we're going to have to let it cool. We can't just take it off and put it on the balance immediately. Yeah. Mr. Hubble is tough, but I yeah. don't think I'm going to ask him to grab onto that right. dish now. We'll let it cool down and get back to you. Okay. So now we have let the potassium chloride, chloride cool off. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't know if you can see before, but, um, that white substance in there is potassium chloride, and that's mm -hmm. what's left when the oxygen is driven out. So now we need the mass of the dish and the potassium chloride. Yeah, so this mass has the evaporating dish and the potassium chloride. What are you gonna do with that so you can just get the mass of the potassium chloride? Yeah. Okay, and from this, I think we can calculate the percent that oxygen made up of potassium chloride. That's right. Good luck. That's your data. So most of that 13 or so minutes was uh, watching uh, the very exciting reaction. I, I think it's a cool reaction. It is cool. I mean, after a few seconds, you kind of think, okay, I, I got the idea. That went on and on. What is the percent of oxygen 
in potassium chlorate. Use your experimental data and come up with the experimental percent oxygen. And then the theoretical, it, it, someplace on there, it asked you for the theoretical percent oxygen. That's where you would just use the numbers on the periodic table. Don't use any of the experimental data in the theoretical. Just use the atomic masses from the periodic table for the theoretical. Okay? So you're going to find the experimental using the data. Remember, the data should leave you with the mass of oxygen, which you have to find. I didn't just come out and tell you. That's what we do. We make some measurements and we see if we can determine what was the mass of oxygen that was in there divided by the mass of the whole compound. That's what percent composition is. You have the mass of the whole compound at the beginning. At the end, I didn't measure how much oxygen left, but I had the mass of KCl left without oxygen. You're on your own now. It's eight four. Oh my goodness, it's almost time to go. I didn't realize we'd run up to the end of the hour that close. Um, so I'll just leave it up to you. If you want to stick around and work in a breakout room, you're welcome to. I'll create one. If you want to just leave and do this on your own, that's totally fine. And if you want to stay on the session but turn your camera off uh, and stay on in case you have any questions in the next couple of minutes, or if you have any questions now, feel free to ask. Okay. So from now until the end of the hour, you're on your own. You got time to work. And again, if you want to leave, you go right ahead. It's fine. Uh, Ella, I see that. I'll do that right now. Mr. Moore, yes. Um, do we have to use significant figures for this one as well? Always, yeah, especially for labs. The most okay. important time to use sig figs is on labs. Yes. Okay. Thank
Um, Mr. Moore, I don't really get the difference between experimental percent and theoretical percent. Experimental percent is where you're using the data that we collected in the lab. You use the actual mass of oxygen that left divided by the measured mass of the compound. Where you use the experiment, not where you, but when you're asked for the experimental, the experimental is using, sorry, the, the data. When you're asked for the theoretical, you just use the masses of K, C, L, C, L, and O from the periodic table. Oh, okay. All right. And the two should be very close to each other. If the experiment was good, uh, that means that Mr. Heppel did a good job and uh, the, the, the two are um, like your experimental was close to, the theoretical is like the accepted value. Okay. Uh, where the experimental, hopefully you did it well, right? So that's, that's why we compare the two. And then the last blank says your percent error. Is that just where we show our work? Oh yeah, shoot. I was going to talk about percent error. No, um, uh, or is like how much the difference is between experimental and theoretical? Uh, uh, it's the difference between the two divided by the theoretical. Uh, I'm going to put that in as an update. So yeah, that's going to go in as a Schoology update because I've had a lot of people leave. I forgot we didn't talk about percent error. Nuts. It does show in the parentheses that you subtract it and then you divide it and then you multiply by 100. Okay, okay. Yeah, so Suan, uh, just go ahead and plug those numbers in. So you got right on. Uh, the actual and the theoretical. I didn't calculate yet. I wrote the data down, but I figured it, it went well. Um, good. So yeah, we should, we'll come up with uh, something around zero. Okay. All right, gang, at this time, uh, class is over. So um, good luck on this. And just send me a note if you have a question about anything. I'll get right back with you. Bye. Bye.